Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Our third class on 1 Corinthians. Let's open in prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we want to, as always, Lord God, just commit our time and our minds and our hearts over to you, Lord God, that you would be um, our instructor, our teacher, that you would send the Holy Spirit, Lord, to uh, to guide us and lead us into the wisdom uh, through your word, Lord God, and help us to learn and grow and know you more deeply than ever before because we are willing to be transformed in the renewing of our minds, Lord God, and committing ourselves completely into your hands. So I just pray that your blessings will be upon everybody who uh, has come tonight and help us, Lord God, to all uh, learn from you and grow closer to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. So before we even do anything, I got to say the scheduling note is no class next Tuesday. Our family's uh, on a vacation, and I thought we might be home by the time the class started, but uh, the plane got rescheduled, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we don't get home till 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Um, so you don't want to start the class at 10, I'm sure, so or 11. Neither do I. No. So just uh, put in your notes there. My apologies. No, no class next Tuesday. We'll pick it up again on the 21st. So I hope to see you all back, and you don't get that that change doesn't uh, throw a, a r monkey wrench into your scheduling process, huh? I am not here Sunday. That's correct. Right. We have uh, um, our, our uh, missionaries from Ukraine are going to be here helping to share some wonderful things. So, yeah. All right. So let's get started into First Corinthians. And so we we finished off right through our notes last time. But there is kind of a transition thought or process here right at the end of chapter two and leading into chapter three. So let's um, I'll leave it on that for a second. Um, and so I just want to kind of refresh where we were at. So Paul's going through this discussion and he talks about, and we, if you recall from last week, Paul says, you know, no one knows what's inside the heart or the mind of a man except for the man himself. And then therefore nobody knows what's inside of God's mind except for God himself. And then um, he says, you know, but we've got the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit comes in just as we just prayed and teaches us and helps us to understand spiritual things, helps us to understand God's mind, God's heart, God's teaching. Um, and so he goes on and say, verse 15, he says, but he was spiritual just as judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? The obvious answer is no one knows the mind of the Lord except for God, but he has also then promised us that we have the, uh, we have the Holy Spirit. And because we have the Holy Spirit, he concludes with this wonderful little verse that says, but we have the mind of Christ. Okay, so believers in Christ, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, have the mind of Christ. Now, don't take that too far. That doesn't mean that I have the mind of Christ, therefore everything I do and everything I say is Christ-like. Um, we still have the flesh. We still have our own mind. But he's telling us we, can, we have access to the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit. So the more we yield to him, the more we submit to him, the more we listen to him, the more we will hear from Christ himself in all of this. And so that all sounds fantastic. There's hardly any interpretive necessary ex extra explanation that's needed for that. We have the mind of Christ because we have the Holy Spirit. He desires to reveal spiritual things to us who are spiritual people. Then you jump into verse one of chapter three and it says, and, or you might even put, but there, he says, but I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So here he is saying, we, God in Christ has given us access to his mind. He wants us to think like him. He wants us to know him. He wants to teach us all spiritual truth. But as I look at, the, at you here, Corinthian church, I can't teach you these things because you're still carnal and you're, ba you're still babes in Christ. Um, and so uh, uh, I don't want to be too harsh on our first Corinthian, first century brethren here. Um, again, this is an early letter to a very early church. They didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have gospels. Gospels were written later. They didn't have Paul's letters. And so they had what Paul taught them about salvation in Christ, and so they were lacking in the kind of things that you and I take for granted. And we carry around, you know, you have one, two, 20 Bibles at home, or you got a Bible app on your phone, and you can get one, two, 20 different translations on your phone or your device of any kind. You know, they didn't have that. And so we got to cut them a little bit of slack. And yet Paul is clearly 
not pleased with the fact that they, after this amount of time, eight, him spending 18 months teaching them, and then him going off on another missionary journey and hearing back about the problems that we looked at last week in the church, he's saying, and you're still babes. Okay, so he's still, he's dealing with that kind of issue. Already laying the theological truth that because we're believers, because we've received the Holy Spirit, we have the mind of Christ. But we can't access the mind of Christ as long as we are still carnal and thinking like mere men, mere humans, rather than fully and completely submitting to the Spirit. And so it's, it's kind of a tension there. How much am I willing to suppress of me? and let him increase. You know, just as John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. And that's really true for all of our minds in our walk with Christ all of our life. We have to decrease, he will increase and fill in as much as we allow him to take authority and command over in our hearts and our minds. Okay. So that's that kind of transition, that pivot point there in um, between chapters two and chapter three. He's, he's told us theologically what's going on. Now he's going to start dealing practically and, and just at the, at the root level, the Corinthians, I still see a lot of problems in you. And the problem is a lack of maturity. Okay, so um, just to kind of, again, before I'll read the next section here, but just gonna give you a little flavor of where we were last week and where we're headed this week. And that is, he, he pointed out, so remember in the first Nine verses of chapter one, he gave them this big you know, introduction, welcome, greeting. Hey, you, you guys are lacking absolutely no spiritual gift. God has given you every spiritual blessing. And then he gets to verse 10 in chapter one and says, okay, but I hear about some major issues going on there. Okay, and so he started to identify these issues and the first one he's gonna call out and we're still dealing with it here in the next, se next section of notes tonight is what I'm gonna just refer to as sin number one that he identifies and that was sectarianism in the church, meaning a divided church. Remember we looked at in chapter one, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas or Peter. I am of Christ. And all of that sectarianism, is, he's going to take really the bulk of four chapters to get through this whole issue of sectarianism that he's dealing with. Okay. So you can re refer back to your notes from last week or the teaching online or whatever you need to do. But Paul's first defense against um, himself being responsible for creating divisions in the church was his limited baptism activity. He said, hey, don't blame me. If you guys are dividing off into different groups and camps and sects, don't blame me. I only baptized like four people. And the rest of the time I just spent preaching the pure, perfect gospel of Jesus Christ. So that was his first defense about people charging him with the reason why there's division in the church. And that's, and then of course, defense number two is, again, is that one also limited teaching the gospel. So we looked at that. He said, you know, I just simply taught about the cross. I talked about how the cross is purely God's work and it's foolishness to all intellectuals. It's foolishness to all religious people, but it's, it's the wisdom of God to believers because we see God's power, God's working and God's uh, purposes in the work of the cross, the atonement, the substitute, penal substitutionary atonement, all that that we looked at last week. So that's as far as we got last week, going through chapter one, finishing chapter one, and really all of chapter two through where we just read. And then we'll, we'll continue on. He's still talking about sin here in chapter three. So he's going to offer what I'll call defense number three, a lack of Christian maturity. We just started talking about that. Number four is going to be God's work versus man's work. And, um, so, and then he's going to offer two solutions at the end, plus a few extra bonus material that we'll look at before we get to chapter five, um, boasting only in God. And Paul says, you know, hey, all of us servants are stewards, not competitors. So we'll see all that tonight as we go. All right. So hopefully that acclimates or orients you to where we're at. So let me just read the first four verses again here in chapter three. Coming out, out of that last verse of chapter two, for we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able. Okay? For you are still carnal. For where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? 
For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? He's saying the evidence bears out exactly what I'm, I'm telling you about yourself. You are still carnal. You are still engaged in all of these fleshly, human activities and not spiritual activities, envy, strife, and divisions. Okay. So, so he's going to uh, go through, and this is, again, his dealing with what's happening here, his defense number three. He can't teach immature people mature topics. Okay? You've got to grow them up. got to help develop them. He can't do it by himself. He can't do it in a way that just says, well, I'm, gonna start, I'm just going to keep teaching you, and I know you're way over here, and I want you to be way over here, so I'm going to teach you over here. He's like, I can't teach you the stuff that I want to teach you because you're still fleshly. You're still babes just barely grasping that faith in Christ saves you, which is great. You got that. But, you're, but aren't you still carnal? Aren't you still fleshly? Aren't you still doing things that the Holy Spirit is asking you to grow in maturity away from? Okay. So he's going to, com- so in part of that, in, this is comparing of people groups. So in our last section, chapter two, Paul drew a contrast between unbelievers who lacked the capacity to understand God's wisdom, the wisdom of the cross, with those who have the Holy Spirit and the mind of Christ. Great. That's, that's, that helps to divide one group from another in a positive way, or at least in a re- representative way. We have unbelievers. They deny the cross. They deny Christ. Then we have another group who ha- should have the Holy Spirit and the mind of Christ. But in this section, Paul draws a contrast between two kinds of Christians, mature and immature. Okay? So that first group is not saved. They don't have the mind of Christ. They only have the Holy Spirit helping them to know that Christ is the answer to all of their sin problems. This next group is a group of believers, but he's going to say, we have, Paul is looking at himself and saying, we have the mind of Christ, and we're mature. And you're struggling because you are, you've been afforded the opportunity to have the mind of Christ, but you're immature. So, um, it, w- when we look at this, Paul, when Paul ministered at Corinth the, for those 18 months before he went on his next journey, he was not able to instruct them with more advanced doctrines beyond the cross and the power of salvation in Jesus' name because of their carnal or worldly way of thinking. So, he wanted to. It would have been great. He, I think Paul had more than enough knowledge to, to grow them up in 18 months towards maturity. But they were still lacking in maturity. And again, I don't want to be too hard on our, on our Corinthian first century brethren. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't grow up in Paul's environment of being a Jew with the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, all of that. They were freewheeling. They, they thought that engaged in all kinds of licentious lifestyles was actually serving the deity that they came from. Right, that they were worshiping in the temple and engaging in these these lifestyles was like somehow serving the God, and so they they didn't. It was a big switch for them to go from pagan gods who actually endorsed sinful behaviors, if you will, or at least through Satan did, to all the way to Christianity, where you're supposed to even have higher standards than the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments. So he wanted to get them there. But again, as he says, he was not able to instruct them in that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. Yep. Oh, no, no. Yeah, sorry. My, my apologies about the, that came out that way. So they are saved, and, and Paul's making a great big point of making sure we understood from the very beginning of this book that they are saved. Okay? They are immature, and they have received the Spirit, but they are not listening to the Spirit. They're not responding to the Spirit, and therefore he wants to teach them spiritual things, and they are engaged in almost every aspect of life in carnal things. Of course, when I say carnal, he's referring to the flesh, he's referring to the body, he's referring to, I want, you know, what my body wants, I'll give it, is kind of the sense of what carnality is. If I'm hungry, I'll eat because my body says I'm hungry, okay? If I'm 
in, in, in the mood for some type of activity, I'll let my body go and do these kind of things, right? That it's that following through with whatever my body tells me to do. And it's the opposite of being submitted to the spirit. And, and he's actually gonna talk about this later, talking about food is for the body, not body for the food, right? You're supposed to give the body what it needs. You don't, you don't, uh, you don't let the body dictate what you do, okay? The flesh or the carnal, so. Yeah. Yeah. They're saved. Yeah, they're somewhere on this growth part trajectory between immature and where the Holy Spirit wants us to be. And I think, you know, if Paul were to say where he's at, he'd say, well, I got a long way to go too. But I've come a long way from where I want you. I want you to get to where I am. Okay, so for sure. So all Christians are saved. This is not a salvation conversation. This is a, what are you doing with your salvation from a maturity perspective? Wonderful point. Thank you for clarifying. And again, my apologies if I, whatever I said wrong, I don't remember. So, okay, uh, number three. He describes this church, the Corinthian church, as being babes in Christ who could only tolerate milk as a newborn babe can only take in milk and not solid food. And we, he also references that in Hebrews 5.12, very much the same language here. You can't take a newborn babe and start giving it meat. You can't start giving it even you know, peas and carrots and stuff. A newborn can only process milk. And so when Paul was in Corinth teaching them the gospel of Christ, he saw them as those who could only receive the, 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 that basic level of nutrition in the gospel, in the teachings of Christ, because anything else in their stomachs or their minds or whatever would just blow up by analogy, okay? Um, and so he wants them to grow. They're the limiting factor in their growth, okay? Their, their lack of submission is what's limiting them. And again, just like in Hebrews 5, the solid food of sound biblical doctrines had to be held back by necessity until they had matured in their walk with Christ. Paul, as I just said, could have taught them, but they were not ready. So number five, unfortunately, the evidence shows that the Corinthians are still carnal in their behaviors, saved, but still carnal in their behaviors, and thus are still immature babes in their faith. Then Paul lists, as we just saw, these lists of proof of their immaturity. They were engaged in envy. Negative zeal is kind of what that word actually means, born out of jealousy. I am zealous. I, I got this kind of, I'm raging. I'm, I, I, you know, I've got all kinds of passionate energy happening in me, but it's, it's all for negative outcomes. It's negative zeal, and it's really born out of jealousy is the root of that. And so, hey, I was baptized by Paul. What do you got? Why are you so important? Oh, I was taught by Apollo. So well, what do you got? You know, there's this, this kind of like envy or jealousy or trying to one-upsmanship somebody because, um, because of so, they thought they were more special or more privileged than someone else in the same congregation and the same body of Christ. Then there was strife and quarreling, wrangling, contending with others over, very, uh, over a variety of various opinions. I'm not sure various of opinions, but variety of opinions there. Um, they were struggling in their lack of unity within the body of Christ. So they were struggling. They were, su they, they were just quarreling. And, and Paul received that note from Chloe's household that we looked at in, uh, last week saying, Wait a minute, you know, if, if this is going on, we've got real, real problems to deal with here at the church. Okay? And then finally, those divisions, disunity, dissension, sedition, which l literally means kind of treason against those in authority. Okay? Um, and so they were, they were, there, was, there was established authority in the Corinthian church, and people were being treasonous. They were r railing against those in charge and not letting them lead. Uh, they were carnal, uh, behaving no differently than the unsaved. Now, this is, again, a great point of clarification. They were saved, but they were acting like unsaved people. In other words, when the rest of the town of Corinth, which was known as being the worst of the worst of, in, in morality, um, they, would they could walk in the church, they could walk in the home of a Christian, and they would feel like they were just in anybody else's house. They saw no difference between the carnality of the church and the carnality of the world that was not the church. Okay. Um, it says, you know, aren't you just acting in carnality? You're behaving no differently than if you hadn't, hadn't been saved at all. Okay. So, he's, you know, if, uh, if I'm a Paul 
it equals being carnal, not spiritually minded. So the, when, whoever that was that Paul was quoting saying, hey, I'm of Paul, that's an immediate red flag to Paul saying, that shows me that you're carnal. You're still acting and operating out of your own flesh. And the same thing with Apollos or the rest. Okay. All right, so that was Paul's proof point. You are still babes. You are still carnal. You are still immature and lacking in all forms of maturity. So um, number six, note on Christian maturity, believers are called to grow and mature in Christ all their lives. Okay. You're never done. I'm never done. We're all never done growing in our relationship with Christ. We should let the Bible and the Holy Spirit continue to transform us, and we should look back every year of our life and say, yeah, I'm still growing. Yeah, I put some things away, and there's more things I've still, the Holy Spirit's calling me to deal with. Um, and so all, in all of our lives, if you haven't received that message in your heart, I would really encourage you to pray about that that we are called to grow at all times, okay? He's always got something for us. He, can, he always desires for us to close the gap between our lack of maturity and our Christ-likeness that he wants us to walk in and be in. And so we are all called to that very thing. So the, practically speaking, this means we, are, we need to move beyond the entry-level doctrines of the salvation by faith. They're great. Entry-level doctrines of salvation by faith are great to get people into the kingdom. And then once they were there, it's time to grow. Okay, sedentary, slothful, lack of or lack of any willingness at all to grow is an indication of spiritual immaturity. Not unsaved, but spiritual immaturity. So this means moving beyond um, Sunday school Bible stories. Okay. If, if, if you grew up and, and went to Sunday school, I didn't, but if you go, go in there and you say, it's all very fresh, it's all very just simplistically taught, um, not necessarily always, simply, you know, the, hopefully we're growing them from, you know, those early uh, elementary school or, or, or kindergarten ages and growing them up all the way through, but it's that, it's not, it's be moving beyond, oh, I know the story of Noah's Ark, but you really don't know the story of Noah's Ark. Oh, I know the story of Daniel and the lion's den, but you really don't know the story of Daniel in the lion's den and all of what that entails, right? You, you, know, you know all these stories, they sound familiar, but the theological application, the overall uh, placement of that, that passage, that scripture, into the context of Israel's history or our Christian church walk is much deeper than most people give it credit for. You know, and I'll just you know, use Daniel because it's such a great both example of a, a book, you could, uh, first six chapters of Daniel, you could teach in any Sunday school and just really get you know, these great, wonderful stories out of, and every kids will just love it. They can draw um, you know, crayons and, and coloring pages and all of that on it. But when you actually look at what's going on in those first six chapters of Daniel, there's powerful, powerful things going on that God is doing in and through his people in, in their captivity in Babylon. So, moving beyond the Sunday school stories, meaning the Sunday school level of knowledge and, and taking the same stories, the same scripture references, and seeing how much deeper God wants us to grow and, and learn from those stories. Okay. Um, and it means purposely learning sound doctrine as a mature believer is called to do. I don't believe anyone just stumbles into sound doctrine. Right? One of Paul's favorite terms in terms of telling us we're supposed to learn about God and learn about, about Scripture, he says it's got to be sound doctrine. It's got to be what we learn and what we teach and what we know in our mind has got to be in accordance with the truth that's actually communicated by God to us through his word. And so I don't believe anybody just stumbles into it. They don't know just says, oh, sure, I understand penal substitutionary atonement. I figure that out all on my own. No, you, you don't get there without actually learning about what it means that Christ went to the cross, died for our sins, and became our substitute on the cross for us. You have to actually learn it from God's word. None of us will just intuitively know, oh, sure, that's the way life works. Doctrine is tough. And so purposely engaging in learning the things that God wants us to learn about. Um, in, in many ways, for all of my life, people have said, you know, theology or doctrine, you know, those are dirty words in the church. Nobody wants to learn about doctrine. Nobody wants to learn about theology. Just teach them the basics. And 
I never have, sorry, I won't do it. Um, I teach sound, I try to teach people sound doctrine and, and move it through. Um, they're not dirty words. They, they, knowing who God is and knowing what he wants from us, what could be more important in life, really? And so Paul, I believe, calls us to learn sound doctrine, meaning we have to intentionally engage. We have to learn from those who've walked those paths before us. And we have to then check out those who are teaching, make sure that we always go back and don't just accept that what anybody says is true. We always go back and reference the scripture to see if scripture supports what that person who's not God, but speaking words of God, make sure that they're correct. But that doesn't mean we, we, we walk through life with an attitude of distrust of people, preachers and teachers and all of that, but we still have a responsibility to check out what they do. And it means we have a personal, direct responsibility to grow in Christ all the way into the level of maturity. Okay. All right, so now he's going to switch. Hopefully that one makes sense. Switch to the fourth defense for Paul, God's work versus man's work. So picking up here in verse 5 of chapter 3. So he's going to take this concept of your carnal, why are you rallying under me or anybody else? Verse 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor." And then I'll they just it kind of, verse 9 is kind of transition. It kind of both belongs in the next section and the previous section. So, for we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field. And then it goes on to talk about the building, the next analogy he uses. So, we'll start with that first section there. So, Paul and Apollos, and remember from chapter 1 as well as Cephas, are ministers doing the work God has called them individually to. Okay. There's no competition. Well, well, we'll see that. So God used them to reveal his gospel message to those who believed. So each one of them, in some way, was used by God to reveal the gospel to this church. That's obviously they knew them by name. They, they knew what they were teaching. So God was using Paul and Apollos and Peter to reveal the gospel message to them. Okay? So they weren't in competition. They weren't setting up divisions, they were simply teaching the truth that God had called them to. Point B, the Lord gave a gift of faith to the believers in Christ. Human ministers can't be the ones who do that. I can't give anybody a God's gift, a gift, a spiritual gift. God alone gives that gift. And as we talked about uh, probably in more detail last week, is we ha each have a gift. We're supposed to use the gift we're given. And as we look around the body of Christ, we should see not one gift given to everybody, but we should see different gifts given to everybody in the body so that the whole body has the right gifts and the right time and the right places to serve and build the kingdom of God. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered. Two different functions, both absolutely necessary and both brought about the end result of people getting saved. So Paul, as we just said, planted the foundation of the seed, the gospel message. They, nobody had ever heard this message until Paul showed up in, the, in, in Corinth and started preaching. So Paul planted the seeds. They may not have germinated at all. He may have just been preaching, and people may have heard him, and they went, well, that's interesting. I've never heard that before. And maybe, they, they, maybe it took root. Maybe it didn't. Obviously, some did. But then after Paul comes Apollos, who waters. He's taking that next step of ensuring that the message of the gospel is communicated to this body of believers or this group in the Corinthian church that were listening to them. And so uh, Apollos is doing exactly what God had called him to. Whatever, you know, by analogy means he was, he was watering by, by, by ministering after Paul had already finished his service, okay? But the increase only came by God. He should, so God should receive all the credit and everyone in the church should be unified in glorifying God only. Don't glorify Paul. Don't glorify Apollos or Cephas. God's the one who brought people into the kingdom of God. There is, there is no other. Okay? And so the believers came by God, 
This is consistent through all New Testament teaching that no one comes to the Lord except the Lord calls him. No one calls Jesus Lord except the Holy Spirit calls him. This is, this is what consistent theology is, is that the Lord is the one who gives the increase to the kingdom. But that doesn't mean that Paul didn't have a role and that Apollos didn't have a role. They most certainly did. But God gave the increase. So why would anybody rally under Paul to the exclusion of somebody else? He was just serving in his gift, as was Apollos. Okay. So Paul the planter and Apollos the waterer are fully unified in Christ. And each will be rewarded for fulfilling the ministry God had called them to individually. This is so important for all believers in the church using their gifts today. It doesn't matter what gift you have. It matters how you use the gift he's given you. And that is what God wants because he wouldn't have given you that gift if it didn't have a purpose in serving and building the kingdom of God, whatever that gift is. Now, we, we'll talk specifically about what those gifts look like and how they operate when we get to chapter 12. But all Paul did was do what God gifted him to do, as we just keep saying. And Apollos did exactly what God gifted him to do and God was using their gifts to build the kingdom. So Paul will not be rewarded for watering if he was called to plant. He is only going to get a blessing from God or a reward from God if he does what God told him to do. He could say, wow, there's a lot of watering that needs to be done here. I guess I'll just pick up the, uh, the pot and start watering. But God had called him to plant. God had called Apollos to water. So Paul needs to do the, call, the role he was called to as, as Apollos and the rest. Okay. And Apollos will not be rewarded for planting if he was called to water. Same concept. And neither Paul or Apollos will receive a reward for the other's labor as they are both hired servants, using that terminology, in the same field that God had placed them in. So both of them were called to minister at Corinth. Both of them were called to bring believers closer to God, convert unbelievers to believers, and to preach and teach the word of God. But neither of them will receive a reward by doing somebody else's work. They were servants, and they were equal while different roles. Okay, so this is true, again, throughout all of the Christian. I mean, you can talk about male and female roles. You can talk about pastor and, and deacon roles. You can talk about all kinds of roles that happen within the church. And everybody's supposed to stay within the limits that God has placed them in and serve them according to his word and the Holy Spirit's calling on them. And that's where they'll be rewarded. Now, don't hear me. Don't get me wrong. You know, if, if I need to go do something that's not normally my gifting or my calling because there's a hole somewhere and I go do it, I'm not going to get like, you know, chastised by God for, for not doing, for doing something that just absolutely needed to be done. But it, the point Paul is making is, is rather, you know, academic in the sense, do what you're called to do first and foremost. Okay. Then um, if there's, there's a need because people are people and flesh is flesh and people don't always pick up the, the gifting that they're supposed to use, sometimes we end up doing more than one particular task, but that's not what Paul is talking about here. Well, we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 12. Um, you know, I mean, we can just, just say in, in most cases, uh, it's, it's one of these things you, you may not know. Now, sometimes you just have a, the Holy Spirit really will reveal to you something. You just kind of know where you're supposed to be. Um, in other cases, it's, it's one of these things where you say, well, I don't know. And, you know, you could use an analogy of, you know, a football team or a baseball team or something. I don't know if I'm supposed to be the catcher or the pitcher, but I'll try both positions and see which one seems to receive the greater internal satisfaction for me and where others see that, hey, that's really a good gifting for you. Or you're a shortstop or you're an outfielder or you're a first baseman. You know, you just start playing the positions and suddenly the clarity of what God has gifted you to do starts to become far more prevalent in your mind or apparent in your mind as well as in the mind of others who will come back and confirm what you are, what, what, how you serve best, okay? So it really is trial until you see is, it is a valid approach. The Holy Spirit telling you is certainly a valid approach, but a lot of times you see a bulletin that says, hey, we need Sunday school teachers, you go try serving in Sunday school, and it, it'll become fairly clear whether or not that's something you're called to do or not called to do, or wherever the service role may be, so.
That, it, it, I mean, it's not, it's not always about what you're good at. You know, if, you're, if I'm good at accounting, doesn't necessarily mean that my role in the church is accounting, but I, it may be. But, it, but it's, so far, it really has never been, you know, that I, that I can do business and accounting type stuff, sort of, you know. But that's, that's not really where God has ever called me in the church. So what you, what you might do in a secular role may or may not fit well within the church role. But how you learn where you're, where you're needed most and where you're, where you're blessed most is probably by trial and error. And seeing where opportunities arise Greeters, ushers, Sunday school teachers, making coffee, doing live stream, doing, you know, whatever. You serve somewhere and you see what might be available and, and how it might bless you and bless others. So, hope that helps. Okay, um, and so continuing, so now we have another example. This one's a little longer. So, the second half of chapter, or verse 9, chapter 3, Paul says, you know, so we are God's fellow workers and you are the field and you are God's building. And so he's transitioning to a second component here. So verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another will build upon it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved, yet as though through fire. Okay, uh, well, maybe I should read through 17, I think. Um, so, do you not know that you are the temple of God and, the, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, he, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Okay, so we'll get back to that part at later. So now he's moving from a seed planting field analogy, okay, into a building analogy really and he's really talking the building is got in mind as you see at the very end there is the temple of god he's talking about building and cons a construction project but the construction project is the temple of god but not like the old testament temple or tabernacle under under moses or david or solomon but this is really the temple inside the believer but he'll, we'll get to that so Paul is referred, refers to himself here. He's, he considered, he's considered by God to be a master builder in God's house, but only by God's grace given to him. Okay. So in his role, Paul was called to lay the foundation. So the master builder is laying the foundation, not called to build upon the foundation. Okay. So Paul is called to bring unbelievers into the kingdom by being an apologist, an evangelist, and a missionary, going out and traveling the world and preaching the kingdom of God is at hand, repent, be baptized, really, and specifically for Paul, it was to the Gentile world. So Paul was called the apostle to the Gentiles, and so he would travel many, many miles. I mean, on, on ship and on foot and whatever, he, many, many thousands of miles Paul traveled to go do the role that he was called to do. He was not called to build a church or build this, found, you know, to take a foundation, build it, and then just keep growing and stacking more and more things on top of it to make it look like a fully operating church body. He was called to go and lay the foundation, pour that concrete foundation, build upon that foundation, knowing that someone would come along behind him and build upon it. So God had another servant in mind in each, each location, in each case, to build upon the foundation that Paul laid. Now, in case you're confused by this, all this, the foundation is we're going to go back to is the cross. The foundation that Paul preached and the foundation that Paul laid in the building of the temple in the hearts of every believer was that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. His blood was shed to it as a matter of a substitutionary atonement that brings us into relationship with God. And that's what Paul was called to teach. And that was, and preach and teach and do all those things. Now, we see through this letter and through other letters that Paul wrote, he got very deep in theological topics and dealing with things. But his 
calling, his ministry was to go. Go here and preach. Go here and preach. Go here and preach. And he probably had roughly the same kind of sermon every place he went. I mean, I'm not, you know, we don't know that. I mean, obviously, when he was standing before the Areopagus in, you know, in Greece, he would kind of use a different message because they would hear a different message than maybe the people in Thessalonica would. But he, he was preaching the pure truth at the basic level, the foundational level, that Jesus Christ is God and he died for our sins, and he wants to, God the Father wants to have a relationship that can only be accomplished through the blood of Christ. Something along those lines. So that's the foundation he was called to. All believers, let her see, all believers are cautioned as to how they build on the foundation, really the doctrinal truths that Paul taught, that Paul was blessed to be the master builder of. This is the admonition to not change the foundational doctrines as, as were established by Paul. And he himself makes a very strong claim of that very thing in Galatians chapter 1, where he says, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than the one that I have preached to you, let him be a curse, let him be anathema, let him be cast off from the church. If someone tries to say, yeah, that foundation that Paul laid about Christ dying for our sins on the cross, we're going to build a church, but we're not going to talk about that. Paul says, let them be accursed if they change the foundations that he laid. And really, it's not just that he laid it. It's not, we're not talking about 2,000 years ago. Paul laid a foundation in Corinth and Ephesus and other places. He laid the foundation for the whole church for all times. Right? He laid that foundation. That's the one we all today, 2,000 years later, are still building our churches upon. The foundation of faith in Christ and all of those penal substitutionary atonement topics that we've been talking about. Okay, so Paul is very clear in that here and Galatians chapter one is a cross reference for you. He, Paul is saying, do not change the foundation. Changing the foundation creates a separation from yourself out of the kingdom of God because that's the foundation that the whole of the New Testament and the whole gospel of Christ is built upon. Okay, so very important and, and very sad that many, many organizations that call themselves churches refuse to talk about the cross and the blood and all of the things that happen with that. All right, hopefully you can see that one a little smaller. Um, and so it's still going on. So spiritually, as you saw here, there's only two categories of building materials for God's house, okay? Now, again, as you saw from the end, we're not really talking about a building. We're not talking about walls and all of that. We're talking about building in the, in the believer but spiritually, there's only two types of building materials. There's the category one, that which is ordained to spiritually endure into eternity. Okay, that God says, God is using these and, all, and the examples he uses, gold, silver, precious stones. You really can't, you know, you guess you can pulverize them, but you're, they're really, they're in, by God's design, they were intended to last. Gold, you know, the gold that we have now could have been around thousands and thousands of years ago in Solomon's temple. It was designed to endure. It's designed to last. And by analogy or extension, it's designed to actually transition into eternity. Not that the gold will, but by analogy, the works that we are building, the doctrines that we are discussing and building the believer up in, they do transfer into eternity. They don't change just because our eternal position changes as we move from this life to the glorious life that's to come. Category two are carnal and presumptuous materials to be burned up in the judgment. So obviously here he's using the category of wood, hay, and straw all combustible. They're not going to endure a fire. They're not going to endure forever. We probably don't have any wood, hay, and straw that's been preserved for 2,000 years, at least, unless it was in special environmental conditions in which it would last for that amount of time. Then you bring it out into normal conditions, and it's going to not last very long again, right? So Paul is, by again, by analogy, saying people who are trying to build, uh, build false doctrines in the church who are working according to their own flesh rather than according to the spirit, these things that they do are going to get consumed, and he said, uses the word the day, the day of judgment, the final judgment of all things. Any work, any activity, any function that we've done that was in the flesh for our own purposes is going to get burned up. Okay? It has no eternal 
transition value. Whereas gold, hay, and precious stones, I'm sorry, <laughs> gold, silver, and precious stones absolutely extend into the kingdom of God. Wood, hay, straw certainly don't. Um, and again, he, I hope, again, the analogies Paul's using here are not, not bogging you down too much. Well, I'm not talking about real stuff. We're talking about spiritual function, work, doctrines that we're building the church upon. God will only let that which he produced gold, silver, precious stones, he will then transition into the kingdom. That which man kind of, you know, cultivates, wood, wood, hay, straw, whatever, he's not going to let transition into the eternal kingdom. Okay. So number E, or letter E, the spiritual and carnal works will be clearly known in the day of the Lord's judgment. Just said that. So spiritual building materials will receive the eternal reward from God. We're going to see uh, more about this again as we go. There's also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about the Bema, site, Bema seat of Christ, and it's the same concept. Spiritual works will receive a spiritual reward, and earthly, fleshly, carnal uh, works will be burned up okay, and not receive a reward. So the carnal building materials will be consumed by the judgment fire, and that's the real judgment fire. Everything else you've ever pictured in your life is probably not, but this is the one where there is that, that fiery judgment before God's throne. He will only allow holy things into his presence. Okay? So man's works by nature are not holy. Man's works done by the Holy Spirit are by nature holy, because it's the Holy Spirit who is actually providing the work. We are, we are cooperating. We are stewards. We are servants in the work that he's called us to. It's different than me just doing things of my own strength, my own effort, my own mind, and saying, well, surely God will accept that which I do. No, he will only accept holy things into a holy, his holy kingdom, and that means it has to be initiated and done predominantly through him with us as his servants, not as us trying to be the master and then twisting God's arm and saying, well, I worked for 20 years doing this in the church. Aren't you going to bless me for that? And God says, well, you didn't do it because I told you to. So no, it will only be because the Holy Spirit has led us into that. So I hope that kind of that makes sense in the sense of we have to be first entirely dependent on the Holy Spirit if we're going to expect any kind of well done, good and faithful servant by God at the end, it has to be because he, we're doing what he called us to. All right, and then letter E, the spiritual and carnal works will be uh, clearly known in this judgment. So oh, continuing on here, believers who have their works burned will suffer loss by the way of having nothing to show for their work in the kingdom. But once again, there's a statement here that they, they themselves will be saved. Okay, so... Um, if, if that gives you hope and confidence, well, that's a very low-level expectation for yourself, I, I would say, right? That, okay, well, I'm, I'm still a believer, so everything I did for 40 years as a Christian is going to get wiped out and burned, and God will have no memory, remembrance of it whatsoever. But, hey, I'm still, I still made it across the finish line. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. That's not what God really, that's not the passion and the, the vision God wants us to have for our lives. Okay. Now, it, it, the believer ha should have confidence that it's not about the things that I do. It's about the person I believe in and that nothing ever changes that. Okay. But Paul and, and the New Testament and obviously the Holy Spirit, and therefore I would hope to encourage you, seek to do the, the gold, silver, precious stone kind of work and leave behind the, the wood, hay, and the stubble or the straw because that's not going to gain us anything in, a, in, a, in an eternity that will far exceed this little teeny blip of a life we have here on this planet for this life. Okay. So the analogy that Paul is using here is consistent with the foundational teaching of being saved by faith and not by works. Works have a purpose, again, but not for salvation. So I love how, how consistent the Holy Spirit is. I love how consistent Paul is. There's never a time where Paul leads you down a path where you think, well, I'm supposed to work for my salvation, okay? And there's never a time where he says that your carnal works will be blessed by God. It's always, no, you believe, and because you believe, you are saved. And because you are saved, God has a plan and a purpose 
for you, and that includes doing the things that he's called you to, Ephesians chapter 3, or chapter 2. Um, so it, it, Paul is entirely consistent in that message, regardless of how many decades he, he had gaps between his writings. He was entirely consistent salvation by faith through grace alone, and you're called to put your faith to work for the kingdom of God. Letter F, uh, Paul then moves from these analogies of seeds and construction to the reality that believers need to properly understand, and here it is, that believers are the new temple of God where the Holy Spirit dwells in the church age. Okay? This may or may not be something that is uh, hard for the, the uh, Gentile believers to understand in Paul's day. This would have been incredibly difficult for the Jewish believers to understand. What? The temple in Jerusalem doesn't have any purpose or value or, or uh, function anymore in God's kingdom? The, the temple is in me and in you and in all believers? That would be a hard concept for them. Uh, but Paul here writing to the Corinthians is letting them know all of this work that's being done is in the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells and resides, and that is in believers. That's the temple of God. And this is one of the, probably one of the top verses or top sections in Scripture that talk about believers are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. So the moment we believe, we are then a place of residency for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us. And it shouldn't surprise us, especially when we look back at the, at the book of Exodus and we see, and the book of Leviticus, and we see how the tabernacle was instructed to be uh, built by Moses and, and Bezalel and all the rest, right? That we have this, this construction. It was supposed to be holy. You had this, this gate this outer court that was supposed to separate kind of everything outside of it, everything, only thing that could come in there were, were holy things. The priests were the only ones who could go in into that section. And then they had to wash in the labor. They had, well, they had to have uh, a sacrifice, burn sacrifices for sins, and they had to go wash in the labor. And then they had to go t in, into the holy place and tend things. They had to be perfectly clean in order to do that. And then, of course, the Holy of Holies, only the high priest, only once a year. And he had to be fully cleansed by the blood in order to go into the Holy Holies and make atonement on the mercy seat. And, and so at the whole point of me saying that is God wants us to be clean and holy so the Holy Spirit can dwell within us. And so he's, we're built, he's trying to build a spiritual house within us and if we're only making a small little compartment for him to, to dwell in, well, you know, I mean, that's what these immature Christians were doing. They were creating a small little compartment. The Holy Spirit was there. But God wants to fill the whole person. And, and he wants to clean out every one of those little nooks and crannies and crevices that are compartments for our sin to hide in. And he wants to clean them out and take more control and more authority over our lives. He wants the building of our house to be of gold, silver, and precious stones and get rid of the wood and the hay and the straw because that's not building anything and it's not giving the Holy Spirit full reign over my mind, my heart, and my body. And so that's what that whole real analogy is all about, trying to get us to understand it's about where we're letting the Holy Spirit have his authority in our lives. Okay? If it's one, one hour on a Sunday morning is the most you give him you know, all week long, I'll come in, I'll pretend to be you know, clean, Christian, and holy, and then the rest of the week I'll go off and live like the Corinthians live. God, is, God can save a person in that capacity, but he's, God's not satisfied with that being your life choice. He wants the whole temple to be holy. He wants all of it to be wood, hay, stubble, burned so that it makes room for the gold, silver, and precious stones in the body, in the person. Okay. And in part, we see, uh, see that is specifically. So when we overlay that concept, we are the temple of God. He wants to build his spiritual house in every single believer and fill every single believer with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. When we overlay that with what we see, say, in Hebrews chapter 9, in chapter 10, God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. Contemplate that in this section for a moment. God does not dwell in temples made with human hands. 
He dwells in temples made by his own divine making. And so the more I, more flesh, the more carnality that I use to control my life, God's not going to dwell in any aspect of my life that is under my control, made by my human work, my human effort. He will, conversely, clean everything up and make it, and he will dwell in a temple made by his hands. Okay, so I just think that's very, very interesting overlay here. God does not dwell in temples made by human hands, but the Holy Spirit does indwell believers as they become God's temple because of his presence. So God desires to dwell in the church, the body of Christ in the community of the fellowship. And that's that strong sense or understanding of we have a responsibility to God. That responsibility of God is to let him search out every conceivable area of our life that he wants to clean up, let him clean it, and let us then um, move into, and let him come in and build the temple that he wants to build in us. I don't want to overdwell that. I just want to make sure you, you get the concept. Paul is not talking about physical building structures. He's talking about the most internal component of our lives. And he wants to, and the Holy Spirit wants to dwell in a temple not made with hands, which means we have to decrease and God has to increase um, in, in any one of those areas where he's going to dwell for us. Okay, um, let's see. So Paul moves from these, you know, we already talked about that, right? So he then issues a couple of warnings here, and then we'll, move, we'll take a break. So he issues a couple of warnings to, uh, that we need to be aware of as he talks about this whole topic of the human Christian believer is now the temple of God, and God wants to dwell within us, and he wants to clean and purify as much of us as we will submit to him so that we can then be the temple of God. So his first warning here is if anyone defiles the temple of God, he will be destroyed. This is a warning against letting sin lead to apostasy by denying Christ. Okay, So I, I mentioned uh, early on, there's just only a couple of warning verses in Scripture, in, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians about, hey, you might lose your salvation here. I think this is one of those, those statements, okay? If anyone defiles the temple of God, well, who's the temple of God? That's all of us believers. <clears throat> if anyone defiles the temple of God, he will be destroyed. So I can't, I, you know, I can have all kinds of negative influences on people, but I honestly can't change your faith con condition with Christ, okay? I can only change my faith condition with Christ. So if I destroy, if I'm destroying a temple, the one, the temple I am destroying is my own. Okay, right? I can I, I can give I can I can be a false teacher and I can lead all kinds of people astray, but the ultimate choice to deny Christ or to accept Christ is yours and mine alone. I can't make it for anybody else. So again, I think this is a warning to the believer. Do not destroy the temple of God that is in you because if you destroy the temple of God that's in you and he can no longer dwell there, he will destroy the temple that he abandoned because you abandoned him. Okay? That means apostasy. That means walking away from faith in Christ. The second warning, if anyone destroys or corrupts the church of God, he will destroy them for defiling his temple that affects believers' personal walk with him. So, this is destroying the lives of other believers, and this is, in part, that, that false teaching thing. So I, there is a warning here not to let the church drift away from sound doctrine. All believers, and this is, really, and, and this is not leadership. This is obviously leadership, pastors, elders, all who have authority in the church, they should take responsibility to make sure that what we do is always biblically sound, grounded on sound doctrine at all times. But the church also has a responsibility to ensure that the leaders are not following some trend, some fad, doing something that will bring harm and destruction to the church. And so it, it still needs to be done decently and in order and through proper communication things, but, but believer, all believers are called or cautioned or warned, don't let the church get destroyed 
because of a bad apple or a bad leader or a bad teacher who is telling people falsehoods to gain popularity, to gain attendance, to gain financial resources, or just because they're following Satan rather than God. Okay, so we all have a personal responsibility to our own temples and to not deny Christ, but we also have a responsibility to the church at large. God loves the church, and he does not want to see the church drift away from him in mass. And so, like I said, I can't change your salvation status, but a bad leader, a false teacher, and, a, and, a, and sex within the group, various you know, divisions and sectarianism within the church can lead wholesale groups of people down the wrong path that are, they ultimately have some responsibility to what happened, what the outcome of those decisions might be. Okay, so we finished number three there. We'll take a break and we'll come back and work through some more.